What do we do from here? Does the trade tension escalate? Does it become a trade war? Or will egos be tempered? Well, the honest answer we don't know. The more optimists say that uh, Trump uh, is just trying to increase his bargaining power and is using these threats as a way of opening up China. I have a slightly more pessimistic view uh, because the economic nationalists are in and those who are internationalists are out. You have had Gary Cohn leaving the administration and now you have people like Light Tiger and Peter Navarro that are very uh, protectionist and the president himself is very protectionist. But there's also a geopolitical dimension of it. The U.S. Uh, rightly or wrongly fears that the rise of China is going to be a threat to the U.S. economic and security future, the way Navarro put it, said they're trying to steal from us the industries of the future, and that threat to our economy and national security. And therefore, the fact that Tillerson is out and you have Pompeo uh, being Secretary of State and the fact that now you have a new, much more hawkish national security advisor, uh, John Bolton replacing McMaster suggests that the whole posture of the U.S. in this relation with China is going to be one of rivalry. Okay. So this but is not just about trade. But, but if this is about bargaining with the U.S., right, if this is getting a fairer deal, can protectionist measures actually help your economy? Can the U.S. economy be better off if President Trump and his administration get a better deal with China? Well, the risk with uh, protection <clears throat> is that the trade skirmish ends up into a whole-scale trade war started with $3 billion of uh, tariffs on steel and aluminum. Then they doubled down with the $50 billion. And now, overnight, the president is saying we might add another $100 billion of Chinese export to the U.S. subject to tariff. And each step of the way, China has retaliated. I said, on the $3 billion, we retaliate on the $50 billion. They're not going to stay in idle if the U.S. imposes another $100 billion of tariffs on other Chinese goods. And this is not just on the goods. There is the Section 301 investigation, and the U.S. might sanction China because of its uh, opening market practices, IPR, technology transfer. And this seems like a situation could escalate in a full-scale yeah. trade war. That's all well and good, but far more important is to be in China. And we are advantage this morning, Norio, with Drew Mattis of MetLife with us, whether he's holding court at the bar at the Mandarin in Hong Kong or the jazz club there at the Peace Hotel on the Bund in Shanghai. What did you observe in your recent trip in China? Uh, well, I mean, I, I think that, you know, when we talk to a lot of people, uh, what really came across was, was the idea that, that you know, China is moving in a different direction. They're, they're moving towards, um, they're using the One Belt, One Road initiative to kind of expand uh, towards the Middle East and towards the Europe and, and to build out their own um, their own sphere of influence uh, in the region. Well, this is critical. Robert Kaplan out with his new book, The Return of Marco Polo. Can't say enough about it. But is it a nostalgia for the 13th century? I mean, come on, that, that's, that's great for books. But what's the reality of building what Marco Polo lived years ago? Uh, I don't think it's that. I, I think they're trying to find new markets, uh, and they're trying to diversify their risk away from, uh, from the West. Uh, and I, I think, you know, when, when we try to put everything in context about what's going on today, uh, we can see some of this is just a, a um, and, and, and these, uh, these little battles that we're having um, as, you know, uh, we're uncertain as to where they want to head. Um, and they're uncertain exactly what we want from okay, them. Okay, but the, the, the president of China, within all the domestic politics of China, is looking to the Indian Ocean as one part of that new Silk Road. He's obviously looking west through his deeply troubled western China. The president of the United States, I'm going to suggest, is looking west to West Virginia. I mean, it, to me, it's almost two dialogues. As Professor Rubini says in Italy, I mean, there's almost two dialogues going in in this trade, this trade spat. Yes, uh, one of the very smart people we had the opportunity to talk to uh, put it very simply and I think correctly, which is that the U.S. and China fundamentally just don't understand each other uh, and that we tend to talk past each other. And I think you're seeing that now. Um, I think, you know, the, the president's actions, uh, the administration's actions, um, you know, probably, you know, outside of New York City are, are playing pretty well. Um, oh, I 100 percent agree with that. And I think the president's aware of that. And so is Dr. Navarro. It's playing well. But at some point, exogenous shocks come. Well, frankly, endogenous shocks can come on. But that shock can be out there. I mean, Norio Rubini wrote Crisis Economics and those crises come on, don't they? They do. And, and, you know, you can actually see this in the size of the tariffs. Uh, the U.S. puts on a tariff on a bit, approximately, probably, you know, I mean, 10 percent of U.S. Uh, of Chinese exports to the United States. <clears throat> 
China retaliates with the same number, but that represents a much greater percentage of U.S. exports to China. Right. Uh, and so, you know, I think that that's an example of the two countries talking past each other. Uh, you know, if, from the Chinese point of view, they were just matching what we were doing. Right. From the U.S. point of view, they upped the ante, perhaps. Right. Um, and so that's where the risk is. And I think that's why people are, are concerned is because it's very easy for these misunderstandings to get out of hand. Dr. Rubini, what will bring discipline to the president's message? I mean, can Lawrence Kudlow, who will be with us later, can Larry Kudlow do it? Or does the dollar bring di uh, discipline to the president's message? Well, I'm not sure that his uh, economic or national security advisors are going to be able to convince him uh, to change uh, tack on protectionism in China. If anything, some of them are economic nationalists mm -hmm. and security hawks. I think that the discipline is going to eventually come from the markets. We've already seen how this rise of trade tension has led uh, to a significant market correction. 10% uh, from the peak in the last uh, month or so. And if these trade tension were to escalate, uh, you're going to have more of a correction. Already a trillion dollar of uh, national wealth in the equity market has been wiped out by statements and action on China. So at the end of the day, I think it's going to be more market discipline rather than his own advisor's discipline. It's going to force him to change tack. And eventually there'll be not just market implication, but also economic damage. We start a trade war. Uh, it's not a zero-sum game, it's a negative-sum game. In trade wars, everybody is a loser. So uh, that's a risk we're facing right now. Let's go back to the market correction. How much, so if this escalates, how much would be wiped off global markets? And does it impact the Chinese market, the U.S. market, or globally all markets? Well, it depends on the size of this uh, trade war. And recent market correction has been driven not just by concerns about the trade war, but also rise in U.S. inflation, also this backlash between, uh, against big tech and so on. So there are many factors at play, and you have to think about which scenario. But I would say, you know, of course, during the Great Depression, the smooth holly tariff led to a collapse of world trade of two-thirds of it and a collapse of stock market. I don't think we're going to end up into a Great Depression, but there's a risk that this trade war escalates in a way it's going to damage economic growth. And um, Bernard Couré from the ECB presented here at the Ambrosetti Forum some estimate based on a model of this be about the economic damage is going to be significant, not just for U.S. and China, but also for Europe and the rest of emerging markets. What do you see first, a repricing in bonds or a repricing in equities? Well, uh, I would say that if this risk off continues, what's going to happen is, first of all, is a repricing <clears throat> of equity as has occurred. And paradoxically, or maybe not so, whenever there is a significant risk off episode, bond yields go lower rather than higher. They'd gone higher in February because there was worry about a surprise on the upside in U.S. inflation. But right now, the market worries are becoming that all this talk about trade war is going to have an economic damage, slow down economic growth, and that leads to lower bond yields yeah. at the same time where stock prices at the south. Norio, you and I have talked about your doubt of supply-side economics. Even Dean Hubbard, Glenn Hubbard at Columbia Business School, has questioned the certitude of Trump's supply-side uh, economics. Give us a primer again here, and you can even fold in trade if you want. What's your problem with Trump supply-side economics? Well, all sorts of studies suggest that... Uh, the economic impact of the tax cut on growth is going to be very modest, and we're going to have a widening of the U.S. fiscal deficit between the tax cut and the spending increase. We're having a 2% of GDP fiscal stimulus for the first time when we are not in a recession and we're not in a major war. Usually those massive fiscal deficit occur during war or recession, so that's going to leave us with less fiscal space when we have the next recession, but more importantly, in an economy that's close right now to full employment, there's not much of an upward gap. The unemployment rate is close to the natural rate. Mm -hmm. These uh, fiscal stimulus could lead to an overheating of the economy, a pickup in inflation more than the Fed and the market expect. And the Fed today is telling us three hikes this year, three hikes next year, but already a number of analysts in the private sector say the hikes this year could be four or five. 
and they could be up to four next year. This is something that markets are not prepared for. If we hike five times this year, four times next year, short rates are going to be higher, long rates are going to be higher, credit spreads are going to widen, the dollar is going to become stronger, and a correction of the stock market could become a full-scale bear market. And if you add to that one, then the protection is risk is going to slow down further growth and potentially increase inflation, that adds to this risk uh, to the economy. Would, That's why markets are becoming nervous. Would the Trump administration allow a strong Dollar? Well, the official policy is uh, effectively one of a weaker dollar because the white blue collars that voted for Trump need to have jobs and income. But if you have a fiscal stimulus like we had during the first Reagan administration and you have tighter monetary mm -hmm. policy, that policy mix of a stimulus on the fiscal side and tighter monetary policy could lead over time to a strengthening of the U.S. dollar. And that's going to further mm -hmm. hurt the jobs and income of these workers and it's going to mm -hmm. make the administration even more protectionist. And so we certainly know that the 2 percent of GDP fiscal stimulus is going to worsen the trade balance of the United States. Any economic model and empirical evidence yeah. suggests that. So over the next year or so, the U.S. trade deficit is going to widen by another 1 percent of GDP. Then the Trump administration is going to blame it on China or Europe, and that's going to create more trade and currency tensions, yeah. if not worse. Noriel, uh, Francine unloaded her Bitcoin at 18,000. She did brilliantly on that. I believe she's picking up George Clooney's wooden boat for a small amount here in Chernobyl after the show's over. Let's do Bitcoin right now. The house, Tom, not no the boat. Yeah, oh, that's true. Sing a single single best chart right now on Bitcoin. We haven't showed this in days. And I, and I got to say, folks, this is a beyond elegant chart. Bitcoin is trending south. Nora Rubini, what I see are governments finally pushing against the nirvana of Bitcoin. What do you see? Well, first of all, as I said, this was a bubble. It peaked at 20,000. Now, depending on the day, is around 7,000 or even with a 6,000 handle. That means that it has lost about two-thirds to 70 percent of its value in the last three months. And I think from here it's going to be headed south. People, people realize this is a bubble. And it's not just Bitcoin, but the ICOs and 1,500 cryptocurrencies or pseudo cryptocurrencies, and the governments of the G20 are going to start to crack down. There is a huge amount of fraud, of manipulation, of uh, uh, stuff that is actually illegal, of skirting securities laws, like in the case of ICO. And therefore, from here on, I see uh, this bubble uh, further deflating over time.